All right, let's continue the Christmas spirit. Matthew chapter number 2. We were looking at it last week. And uh, we're kind of looking at the wise men last week. Now, uh, one thing you'll find as we read uh, Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, both of them very fascinating and historical records of the time of the birth of Christ. And in those two Gospels, you'll find a variety of names. Uh, you always wonder, you know, as God gives us the Bible, why did he go in so much detail that he would put names and locations of those names and he would put times. And here we are 2,000 years later and we're reading about Caesar Augustus calling everybody to be taxed and we're hearing that Cyrenius was the governor of Syria and then uh, as you get over into the book of Acts, you start hearing about uh, Agrippa and Felix and Festus. And who are all these people? Well, all of them are in the recorded history of the Roman and Jewish records. And so what we're getting here, we can go to the Bible and... Uh, it tells us exactly who was serving where at what time and who was adjacent to that person. And I say all this because when you get into these Gospels like Matthew and Luke, you'll find that there are three different type of leaders that are mentioned here. Uh, number one, you'll get into the governors. Uh, Pilate was a governor. And then you'll get into the kings. And the kings were over, uh, they were rulers over a large territory. Uh, and the governor worked under uh, the, the uh, supreme authority who was Caesar, the emperor. At this time, Rome cut, pretty much had everything during the birth of Christ. They had started uh, becoming a powerful uh, nation in about 48 to 50 BC and you can hey, we get down between Malachi and Matthew and you get down closer to Matthew in those 400 years you're going to run into people you hear it's the time of Cleopatra Julius Caesar Mark Anthony all these people were part of that Roman uh, building up that state and that nation and, and the history, and then as you get down to the birth of Jesus' time, I mean, uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar died about 40-something B.C., and then Mark, Anthony, and Cleopatra, you know, they did their thing, and somewhere around uh, 33 B.C., about 20 years before the birth of Christ, 25 years before the birth of Christ, and so then when you get down to the time of 4 B.C., somewhere 4 to 5 B.C., you're going to find that people like Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor. And in the view of the Romans, he was a god. And so when Caesar Augustus, the Bible says in the book of Luke, he said, he sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. And that's why Joseph and Mary had to go and report in a certain uh, province, uh, Bethlehem of Judea, because uh, Joseph's lineage uh, and, and family history came out of that. Now, at the time, Joseph was over in Nazareth, and he was in a different province. But when it got time to be counted in the census, and the census, you know, I hear a lot of debate about, well, the word should be census, and it, it says in the King James taxed. Well, the truth is, the reason they had census was to perform a tax. That's the only reason they made people come and report and record the place of their birth and the place of their land ownership or family land ownership. 
And so the idea was let's get, let's see who's there, let's get them on record, and then we're going to stick it to them. <laughs> and the reason they were going to stick it to them because Caesar Augustus was known as the greatest emperor Rome ever had. Now they had emperors right on up to 456 A.D. And there's been some famous ones that you'll know about. But nobody superseded what Caesar Augustus did. He's the guy that actually created the first fire department in Rome. Funny thing about it, 75 years later when Rome burned to the ground, the fire department got to looking at the flames. They said, we're not going to get involved in this, and they fled. The, the government-paid fire department. Augustus created it. It's kind of like, you know, the police going in there and looking and people are burning the town down. They go, forget this business. We're out of town. You don't blame them at times, but the truth is Augustus created that for Rome, which became a pattern for all of Western civilization. We get our ideas from his creations. You say, that's impossible. Absolutely not. You can, you can trace it for 2,000 years in, in Western civilization. We built societies and cultures. We based them on certain rules and regulations, and they all come during the time of, of uh, Caesar Augustus. He's the guy that got the whole thing started when he said, I want everybody to be taxed, as I said. So you had, you had your, uh, your Caesars. You know, he died, Caesar Augustus did, not long after the birth of Christ. I mean... He didn't even seem to live a year. Look there with me in Matthew chapter number 2. And it said, uh, oh, Herod's the one, but Caesar Augustus died in, seven, in 6 B.C. But Herod died just after the birth of the Lord Jesus. Uh, chapter 2 and look at verse number uh, 15. And was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And then, uh, verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the uh, wise men. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, so Herod was the king under Augustus. And the governor at that time was Cyrenius. All three of these people are mentioned consistently through the preserved Roman history. They have their own documents. And, and so when these people say, well, you can't trust the Bible. Yes, you can. It's historically absolutely accurate. God wrote it. He knows what was happening. He knows who was governor and who was king and who was uh, the emperor. He knew all that. And, he, and for anybody to doubt this book, they're foolish and ignorant is what they are. Because honestly, there's nothing that you read in these gospel accounts cannot be verified by secular history. And that's why when they say, oh, this isn't the word of God, or this is just in a book like any other book. I, I, I would de beg to differ with them on many levels. <laughs> uh, they're, they're trying now, uh, the archaeologists, and it's a shift. For 200 years they dug considering the Bible not to be accurate. And now in the last 30, 40 years they're using the Bible to go find out where to dig. I'm, I'm telling you this thing is, hey, we're living to the end, close to the end. Things have done a reversal. God has opened up uh, history and opened up man's ability to know the truth of this book. Easy now, like never before, in the last 25 years. It's just been a phenomenal thing that's taken place. And so when we read these accounts, not only is it the devotional part that we read, yes, we hear about Jesus Christ's birth and and all that, but it is actually the history book of the world we're reading right here. And when something contradicts it, I go with this book if it seems to contradict it. It, it rarely does, uh, but 
especially now with the new, you know, they've got these, uh, infra, uh, these uh, satellite dishes. They can take pictures from way out in space of these former cities they have never found before. Now they see, can see them on the earth's crust underneath it from way up there. And it's always some city in the Bible that the Lord Jesus said, as they were making their way to Bethesda, Ah, Bethesda, we can't find that city. They've been hollering that for 100 years. There's no Bethesda. Well, up until about 10 years ago, they found Bethesda. And uh, it's a fishing city right by the coast. If you read your gospel, it'll say that. And so we get into all that. And I uh, just want to give you an idea when you look and you see these things. Uh, and, and turn with me to Luke chapter 2. I tell you, there's so much Christmas stuff in here that, uh, <laughs> that it's almost impossible to cover. Uh, but Luke chapter 2 it gives you a, a, a historical narrative of what was going on. Caesar Augustus, he's the uh, main man, but he dies. And in Luke chapter 2, we're going to hear about him, but in Luke chapter 3, his cohort that he raised became the Caesar, Tiberius. Tiberius was the Caesar that was in charge when Jesus was crucified. So Herod did reign for 41 years, uh, Caesar Augustus, I mean, for 41 years. And so in chapter number 2 of the Gospel of Luke, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, the Roman Empire, that all the world should be taxed. Why did he say all the world? Because in the eyes of those in the Roman world, they were the world. You know, you say, well, they didn't, America didn't know about it. Well, if there was anybody in America at the time, they were running around uh, jumping trees and, 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 and shooting buffalo with, with, uh, with a bow and arrow, and they were very, uh, their culture was very primitive. They were, if there was anybody here. I don't know how, you know, we hear... Uh, it's all kind of things like they found this. The other day they said they found something was a 10,000-year-old footprint. Well, we know that's not right. They missed it on that one. But it was somewhere in Kentucky. <laughs> found it in a riverbed. <laughs> I'm thinking, now how do they know that? 10,000-year-old footprint. But there, there, might, there might have been Native Americans in America uh, in the... Uh, early, late, uh, early B.C.s, 4, 5, and then A.D., there might have been. But the world as we know it today, as we see the countries we consider the world, there are certain parts of the countries today we don't even think about as being in the world. I mean, when I think about the Amazon jungle, I don't look at that as part of the culture of the world. <laughs> Just a bunch of tree growth down there <laughs> and some rivers. So it said, Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made... When? Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So we can take uh, secular records and find out exactly when this was. Because they have records of Cyrenius being the governor of Syria when Augustus was the emperor of Rome. And how do we depict the, that we believe that Jesus was born around 4 B.C.? From these two men. I mean, it's pretty easy. And so... And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. That's the city that he had his lineage in. Like I say, the Coolies, we're from Panama City. And, uh, you know, uh, the Roberts are from Jacksonville. So I guess Esther and I have to go to Tallahassee to compromise. <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is you went back to your city of your heritage. And it says, so Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, the house of bread, uh, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So that was where his relatives came from. Uh, and it says to be taxed, I know they like to say census, but it says taxed here twice. With Mary, his espoused wife, uh, that's she's uh, promised to him, betrothed to him. 
he's engaged to her, being great with child. And you know what uh, uh, the other gospel says? That he could have put her away by law because he knew he had not had any relationships with her. And yet she was, he was engaged to her. So this was an absolute cultural no-no that engaged people would have a baby. Joseph knew it wasn't him. So he had every legal right to say, by the law, Jewish law and Roman law, out. But he didn't because he knew that Mary said, Mary had told him, hey, here's what the angel of the Lord said to me, that I was going to be with child overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. So Joseph was a meek and mild and kind and obedient man to God. And therefore, he didn't take his, his uh, rights. He gave up his right to honor God, to, to be an honor to God. And so it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And of course, why would that be? Because everybody was in town having to take this census. Now today, you know how they do it for us. They sent it to us in the mail. <laughs> Thank God, huh? But because they didn't have the postal service as we know it, they said, well, we don't care. The Romans didn't care. He was operating from Rome. He didn't care what these people in Judea thought. He said, get them down there. Tell them all. They got to go back to their hometown. So everybody goes back and fills up the holiday inns and the days in and the courtyards and all that. They fill them all up. Here comes Mary and Joseph's sort of dragging around because she's pregnant. I mean, fully pregnant. About to have a baby. And, uh, and so she, she, they're going slow. So they get to town, there's no place to stay. So it was a very, as you know, treacherous and I think probably a very hard, hard uh, event uh, that taxed them physically. And so, uh, and the Bible says, and she brought forth, notice her firstborn son. You know that a lot of the new Bibles take that out? When you check them out, if you've got a computer program, you'll find uh, they don't like to use uh, first, uh, her firstborn child because, see, they want to make Mary out to be more than she is. Now, she was uh, a chaste virgin, chosen of God, and, uh, but, but she did have other children after Jesus. She did. And so he made sure it was firstborn. As it's a uh, uh, funny thing about how... They've tried, these liberals have tried to change. You see, they've taken the word virgin and they've changed it in most of their newer translations to young woman. Although uh, the, the Greek word that they have access to actually means virgin. But what they've done, they've gone back into the Hebrew word that was given, and it means young woman. So why would it, why should they not choose? Well, when Matthew recorded it, he had the word, the Hebrew word before him. But he also, but he used the word virgin. Although in the Hebrew it can mean young woman or virgin. So you got, you say, well, well, how do we, because Matthew was inspired of God, Holy Ghost, told him which one to choose. And the whole narrative would be, well, what would make sense of the narrative at all if she wasn't a virgin? Uh, what's the big deal? Somebody having a baby. Babies are born every day. So why would this be a significant thing? Well, because we already know what happened. Mary was uh, visited by the angel and God said to her, you know, thou shalt be with child, you know, the Christ child. You've been a chosen one. But uh, so in, in turn, uh, they always mention, uh, they like to uh, glorify Mary, downplay her virgin birth 
in some respects the, the unbelievers do. The religious people like to take her virgin birth and make it out to be a being between woman and angel somewhere in halfway in between. But I want you to look at something on that line and back in the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 2 because all of this you deal with at Christmas time. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you read or see some of these uh, television events where they portray the uh, birth of the Lord Jesus and Mary ends up with a halo around her head, you know, and the light shining out and all that. Well, look at uh, chapter number two because uh, it, gives us, it gives us some clues about this. In verse number 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother. And verse number, uh, let's see, 19 or, uh, yeah, verse number 17 talks about, oh, 20. It says, saying, arise and take the young child and his mother. 21, he arose and took the young child and his mother. What, why am I repeating this? Every time the birth of this baby is mentioned, and he is a young child at this point, they mention him first. If Mary was the magnificent, they would say Mary and the young child. But Jesus is always first. And yet, they take this word, the word for virgin, and they do semantics and they flip them around. It's, they've all got an agenda. All these who, especially those who are creating these new tra uh, translations, it's like they, they, they want to do away with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want him uh, to be God manifest in the flesh. They want to glorify Mary as some queen of heaven. <laughs> okay, and they, But they, while they're doing it, they have to go change all the Bible. They have to get, write, rewrite the Bible. Because if you leave it with the text, it tells you. The young child is the most important thing here. His mother just happened to be alone. <laughs> so, you know, it's fascinating how things happen over a period of centuries where they try to discount what the Word of God says. And so we know that the wise men, uh, in verse number 9, they heard the king departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. So we got a moving star. Now, I said last week, that, and, and I, I don't know if I'll give you uh, the text tonight. We really don't have time to turn to all of them. But in the Bible, you'll find the star mentioned as many cases a person. And I don't, I'm, I'm an angelic person, but uh, uh, even when it uh, you know, talks about it, look at with me in the book of Revelation. Revelation, I believe, chapter number 9. Revelation chapter number 9. I think that's it. Revelation 9, 12. I hope I don't send you on a rabbit trail, but I... I you say, well, we've been a warning all night. Yes, we have. Revelation chapter number 9. Uh, yeah, verse number 1 of Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. Okay, well, you know what the immediate thing you and I are thinking? A meteorite. We think some kind of celestial body, did we not? Star fell from heaven. But look what it says here. And to him, who? The star. <laughs> it's a him. Was given the key to the bottomless pit. I mean, you can't get any more clear than that. The star was somebody. <laughs> so when the wise men said, we've seen his star in the east, they did see a shining light. But that light guided them to Jerusalem first, apparently. And then when they 
got when they when Herod said, Go find the Christ child and you tell me where he's at and I can go worship him. The Bible says, and the star moved and guided them out to Bethlehem, which was ten miles away. Now, could it be that it was some angel manifested himself in a glowing light? Possibly. Um, the wise men, uh, they, they came from Babylon. They knew what the prophet said in, in Micah. They heard what the chief priest said that the prophet Micah had prophesied that, uh, that a star uh, shall come. Uh, uh, Balaam, way back in the book of Numbers, said a star out of Jacob shall come. And so, uh, you know, he, remember the shepherds, an angel came and it was a bright, shiny light. And they, what did they do? They fell down because, and when Paul, when Paul told uh, Agrippa, before Agrippa, and he was explaining his situation, what happened to him on the road to Damascus, Damascus he said, a light shine, he told Agrippa, brighter than the sun. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it can't always necessarily have to be a celestial planet, a star. could be the messenger of God shining brightly, an angel of the Lord, that uh, led these people, uh, the wise men from Babylon, they saw his star in the east, took them right on up to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem out to Bethlehem. So some, some things that, that you could, uh, you know, without preaching it as doctrine, you literally could uh, maybe say that there's something else going on there besides what we know. Well, uh, back in Matthew as we close tonight, chapter 2, I'm just what we're calling this is Christmas thoughts. That's all I can call it because it's not necessarily... Uh, as clear as we'd like it to be. But uh, I just uh, read to you that Revelation chapter 9, but if you look at Revelation, why, don't turn back, but Revelation 12, 4, it had another one. It says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to deliver to devour her child as soon as it was born. So who was the dragon cast into the earth? A bunch of planets? Something's listed that the dragon took there in the book of Revelation and the tail of the dragon cast a third of the stars. Was it, was it planets? Was it meteorites? Or could it have been angelic beings? Some type of either fallen angels or angelic beings. Who knows? But it sure is odd that these things move around and you get over in other places in the Old Testament it even gets clearer uh, clearer information than that. Well, uh, the reason why they fled to Egypt, why did Joseph and Mary feel comfortable enough to go to Egypt when they're from Judea? Well, number one, Herod was going to kill all the kids. And we talked about it last Sunday. He was, he was a murderer. He loved to kill. So he, he, they go to Egypt for a couple of years because Herod died within a, a few weeks, if not a few months. But by the time the wise men got to Bethlehem, he, Jesus was a young child. And so they go to Egypt because Jews were all going to Egypt at that time. When Rome came in and took over, do you know that they got to where there was a business going on? And they had a, you know, we had the wagon train to go out west. Remember how it used to happen? Well, they had a time where all of them were going to Egypt. Because the, the Lord had already prophesied, out of Egypt I'll call my son. Wow. He did that hundreds of years before. So they were down there, and then Herod died. And when Herod died, another Herod came in. And uh, this second Herod didn't last but seven months. Somebody killed him. But his brother was um, in another territory, another Herod, Archelaus, who apparently Joseph and Mary said, well, look, we can't go back to the first 
place because even Herod uh, Agrippa had died. I mean, uh, Herod the Great had died, but the Herod that's there in his place, he is no good either. We're going to go to his brother's place, and that's where they went. It says in verse 19, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph uh, in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he rose and took the young child, and his mother came to the land of Israel. And when they had heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So they didn't like Archelaus. Herod the Great's dead. The son's no better. Notwithstanding, he, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside and, into parts of Galilee. That parts of Galilee was ruled by a different Herod. So there's a lot going on there. Fleeing the one that's going to kill him. Didn't trust the next one that came along. We decided to go to, there's a lot, hey, you know, there's a lot of mobility in this society right here. <laughs> People going different places and moving. I talked to somebody today was telling me that uh, this, their, his family, his, they lived in uh, Ohio, and his dad was going to move to South Florida. And so they loaded up the whole family, and they were headed to Orlando. And what happened was they came by Pensacola to visit some relatives, which is a long way away from Orlando. And they liked Pensacola, so they moved here. And the guy was showing me a picture of the grandparents' house that was on the lot, you know, nearly 100 years ago. And I'm thinking, what? Could you imagine back around the early 1900s a bunch of folks leaving Kentucky, go to the central Florida lake. There wasn't, of course, any Disney World there or nothing, but it was like a bunch of lakes and say, we're going to go down there and live and then stop by an old Pensacola here and say, well, we'll just stay here. <laughs> and the family's still here. The descendants are all here. Well, poor old Joseph, he goes to Egypt. Uh, we're talking 250 miles away. And he stays down there for a couple years. And he comes back. He can't even go back to his hometown. Because the guy, the next president that got elected, he's no good either. So he goes into Nazareth and sets up shop there. And so that's the story. That's some of the rest of the story. Now I know and I hope I didn't just wreck your uh, mental sanity tonight. <laughs> but to me, there's so much going on around the Christmas story. We just read it sometimes, say, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we read the Christmas story. When God is laying out all kind of scenarios and all kind of events, all kind of uh, official records that we have access to, and it's called the Word of God. <laughs> so we ought to pay attention more to it than we do. All right, thank you so much for coming out. We'll close in a word of prayer. Be sure to remember Brenda tonight. I know it's sort of a... Uh, unknown situation in her life. Lord, we pray tonight that you'd be with us as we go and we ask that you'd bless uh, Brenda tonight as she is going through a difficult time and certainly all the others that we had called out. But may God bless them and help us, Lord, bring us back safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.